can't record. Oh, no, you are. Cool. <clears throat> um, we will be recording the video and we'll post it on our Facebook page sometime next week once we get it up and get captions on it and all of that. So that way you can look at it in future. future. If you do have questions, you can shoot me an email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box. We can put that in a couple of times. Through the talk, if you do have questions, if you can type them in the chat and I'll try and take some breaks periodically to <laughs> answer questions as they come up. But for now, I'm going to share. Is everybody seeing the screen? See my talk? All right, I see a yes. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so yes, we are going to be talking today about creating an herb garden, especially here in Colorado. There can be some challenges, there can be some joys and tri trials and tribulations, but it's a pretty good thing to do. Herbs are a nice, nice addition for many, many different reasons. So let's get started. All right. We are going to go through several different things. We'll kind of look at a definition of herbs. We'll look at the history, um, very briefly look at history, um, different types of herbs, um, including culinary, aromatic, ornamental, medicinal. And then we'll look at the things that you need to know to garden successfully for herbs and herbs that are good choices for here in Colorado. All right, so when we think about it, what is an herb? Botanically, an herb is a seed plant that doesn't generally produce a woody stem, although there are exceptions, and usually lives long enough to produce flowers and seeds. Um, but there are other definitions, obviously. Merriam-Webster, if you look at the dictionary definition, it's a plant that is valued for medicinal, savory, or aromatic qualities. And herbs can also be fresh or dried leaves, usually they're more green in color, they're not, not as much colorful. Uh, we know that we've been using herbs for millennia. There are references to herbs back to Egyptian and Chinese texts. Um, we used herbs in America to make our food taste a little less bland uh, and to help with preventing problems with disease, preventing issues of infestation in, in stored foods um, and to improve flavors in general, which is still kind of how we use our herbs. So that part hasn't really changed too much. Pioneer gardens are, are essen um, were essential features of our pioneer homes. People came to the US, they brought the herbs and seeds and cuttings that they'd been using in Europe. And they also started to find some that were growing wild or native, parsley and watercress, wild leeks. Um, I live in Boulder County and there are some stands of asparagus that have actually kind of naturalized as well. Not an herb, but kind of just came to my brain. <clears throat> if you're thinking about herbs versus spices, herbs are usually something that you're growing fresh or you're using dried. They generally don't have a super, super strong flavor and we can grow them in our temperate regions. Spices are more those things that you think of in terms of the spice road. Um, they are the very intensely flavored things that are from tropical areas, the seeds, roots, sometimes bark. Cinnamon is the bark of a tree. Um, and so we're not really going to be getting into the spices so much. We'll be talking about herbs, the things that we can actually grow here in Colorado. Um, and artificial, uh, we're not even going to get into those because we're gardeners, right? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different reasons that people grow and have herbs. Uh, they can be purposes of culinary, they can be aromatic or ornamental, they can also be medicinal, and many herbs fit into one or all, more or all of these categories. So there's a lot of different ways that we can use our herbs. 
Culinary herb is probably where most people think of using herbs. They're most useful for herb gardeners in cooking. Generally, they're used in small quantities because they can have a stronger flavor, especially if they're used fresh. Um, most popular herbs that are used for culinary purposes are things like parsley, which you can use as a, something like a pesto, but typically you see used as a garnish. Sage uh, flavors a lot of our meat. Chives. Chives are a really nice option. They're super easy to grow in any backyard, even in a container, and they offer a lot of different flavor. You can get several different types of chives. chives. Um, and other things like thyme or savory, oregano or mint, um, lots of different culinary things that we, we're all pretty familiar with, but maybe you haven't grown in your yard or maybe you've just not had a lot of success with. So we'll kind of go into these little more these little categories a little bit, looking at aromatic herbs. Aromatic herbs are not quite as popular to grow. Uh, they might have some more novel uses. Um, they're usually more of a pleasant smelling. They might have flowers or foliage that we use for their fragrance, and we might actually um, extract oils from them to. Uh, scent perfumes or toilet water or pr produce other scents. Maybe we put something like lavender in our linen so that it smells nice. So aromatic herbs are not generally as common, but definitely a nice choice, especially if you just want something nice and fragrant in your garden, but you're um, so aromatic herbs, you can, like I said, you can use them to scent linens. Um, usually they can retain their aroma for a long time. So these are things like a mint or marjoram, rosemary, basil, uh, rose or lavender. Um, rose is definitely one you think of fairly often. Um, not typically used when we're trying to eat things or consume anything. And so it's definitely a little bit more on the aromatic side. Mint can be used for all kinds of things. Uh, one use for the aromatics is a, something called a dream pillow, it's kind of a satchel which you fill with herbs that can use to help soothe you, help induce sleep. Um, you can use things like rose, that lavender, calendula, uh, peppermint, depending on whether peppermint is a stimulant or a soothe for you in particular, some people see them in different ways, or mugwort, which is a type, type of artemisia. And we have our ornamental herbs, which are brightly colored with flowers and, and, our, and foliage. There might be um, white or lighter colored flowers. Um, any herb can be grown as an ornamental. You just let it grow in a different way. You can use them as accents in the garden or in pots. Um, maybe variegated thyme and sage, uh, because sometimes you can get herbs that have, have a very different, you, they can have different colors on their leaves, and so they, they just have that little bit more ornamental appearance. If you look at the mint category, there are so many different shapes and sizes and, orient, and, and ways that mint can appear. Um, so you can grow different colors and shapes and heights of mints. Uh, lavender uh, uh, can be very ornamental, can be grown in little hedges. Chives, once they flower especially, are extremely ornamental. So here's just a little example of a, a typical garden, but this is actually a bed of creeping thyme, and so it's a nice way to kind of have your have a variety of things in your garden. You can have your perennials and your um, annual or perennial herbs that play well together. So you don't have to have things in splendid isolation. You can mix and match a little bit if you so choose. Very briefly, uh, there are a lot of herbs that are traditionally used as me medicines or can be can have medicinal qualities. I'm not going to get into this because this isn't, there's not much research substantiation behind it, but a lot of herbs that were thought to have curative powers, they might, um, but we're not going to get into it. If you are going to use herbs for medicinal purposes, use them carefully. Some are harmless, but others can be quite harmful, especially if you have pre-existing conditions or other 
other complications. Okay, uh, let's see. So quick little stop over for questions. So um, if you'd like me to read them to you, there is two. There are two questions I can see. Um, one is regarding uh, uh, herbs and uh, deer resistance. So are there any res uh, herbs that are res deer resistant or even repellent? Uh, the nice thing is that most herbs, because they are so aromatic, are, I, I wouldn't say they're repellent or resistant, but they are less tempting to the de to deer um, and to rabbits sometimes. Uh, but unfortunately, if the deer or rabbits are sufficiently hungry, then they're, they're going to they're probably going to go for them anyway. But because of that strong flavor that most of them have, they are going to be less appealing than other things in your garden. All right. And the other one is, uh, would you recommend the folks belong to the American Herb Society? Is there a local chapter here? I don't know if you know that. Ooh, I don't actually know if there's a local chapter. Uh, if you find one, you definitely can. I do know that, I mean, social media is a nice way to get a lot of information. There should be some pretty good herb, herb groups or local chapters of garden clubs that get into herbs. Um, there's definitely some options there. Okay, those are the two questions we had right now. All right, sounds good. Okay, so if we're looking at herbs, there are kind of two main categories with a second, uh, a third subcategory. We've got our annuals and our perennials. Our annuals are our herbs that will complete their life cycle in one growing season, and the perennials are those that will overwinter and regrow each year. Sometimes they'll die back all the way to the ground. Sometimes they will have kind of a woody structure and regrow from the crown, right, at the, the ground level. And then you do also have a few herbs. Um, trying to think of any off the top of my head as an example and it's not coming to me, um, that are biennial. So they will live for two seasons. The first season, all you will have is foliage, if that's what you're growing it for. Second season is when you will get your blooms and or your fruit. So our annual herbs, some examples are anise, um, our basil, chervil, which I've never grown, um, coriander slash cilantro, and dill. So these are ones that uh, some of them will reseed, like dill is going to reseed and regrow each year. But basil and coriander, you're going to have to replant each year if you want it to keep growing. Here's a nice pretty picture of basil. Cilantro. So the reason I have coriander and cilantro there is they are actually botanically the same plant. You're just harvesting different parts of the plant depending on what you want. And the lovely dill. Uh, perennial herbs, chives and fennel, mint and thyme. Uh, two of these, chives and mint, are definitely fairly aggressive growers. And I'm going to, I have a section later on that is going to get into a lot more detail on all of these plants. So that's why I'm going through relatively quickly here. So fennel, we've got mint, we've got thyme, which I need to update that picture. Um, and then our biennial, there we go. Um, parsley, um, so normally parsley you're growing just for the leaves, so you're growing it as an annual, even though it is a biennial, and caraway, which you are growing for the seeds. So you would be growing that for the second year. So when you are gardening with herbs, you want to make, make sure that you know what herbs you'd like to grow. Uh, so common that it's easy to get kind of excited about growing things and you start buying all this stuff that just sounds exciting, but it's not something that you actually use. So make sure that you know what you, are, what you, are, what you use in the kitchen before you actually start experimenting with stuff. I had one person, it's not herbs, but they got excited and they planted like 15 eggplants and they hate eggplants. And so they just went to waste. And so it's not probably the best way to, to do your planning. So make sure that you're not planting something that you don't care for. For me, for example, I'm never really going to plant lavender. I don't care for the smell of lavender. And so it's not something that I'll put in my garden. 
also think about what you want to use the herbs for. Are you going to dry them and use them in cooking? Are you going to press them? Are you going to use them fresh? Are you going to use them for fragrance in your linen closet? Um, you can visit botanic garden, you can visit a nursery, you can kind of look around at friends and, and neighbors yards, see if they've got anything growing that looks interesting and kind of see how it goes. So some beginner herbs, there are some that have stronger flavors, winter savory and rosemary. Sage has a very strong flavor. Um, if you want more of an accent flavor, you've got your sweet basil and dill, thyme, lavage. Um, if you're looking for blending in flavor, chives and parsley, summer savory. Um, chives and parsley mix in really well with certain butters so that you can kind of make a, a tasty spread, a uh, cooled butter spread. If you are looking at growing outdoors, like I said, you can combine your herbs with any of your existing gardens. You don't have to necessarily keep them completely separate. You can put them in with your vegetables. If you've got a perennial vegetable section or an annual vegetable section, just kind of plan accordingly. You don't want to plant a perennial herb in your, ve your annual vegetable garden that you turn over and refresh every year. Um, and you can put it in with your perennials. In this picture here, we've got chives mixed in with some ornamental geraniums, it looks like. Um, and that might be a little rosemary in the center. Um, if you're thinking about it, you can plant it near your kitchen uh, so you have some nice quick access. Say you are cooking something and it's a finished dish, you just want to throw some of those chive flowers right on top. You can pop out to your kitchen instead of going way back to the, the back quarter, then it's going to be a lot more convenient for you to actually make it happen. So if you are thinking about kind of planning out a garden, a uh, kitchen garden is going to be one where you can use something like a thyme or a sage, you can use basil or tarragon, you can use dill. If you're looking at a garden that you just want one color, you can do whorehound, lavender, and wormwood. Uh, you can plan out, I mean, you can, the world's your oyster, you can do whatever you really want, but these are just some ideas. <clears throat> you can have a, a scented garden. This is one of my favorites. I love fragrances. You can choose your mints and a scented geranium or lemon balm, a thyme and a rosemary. So as you walk through, you can brush your hands over things and just have a nice sensation all around you. Uh, sage, you can do a garden that's completely sages. There's all kinds of different colors. There's a common sage. There's tricolor, which has numerous colors in the leaves. There's golden sage and purple sage. There's even a pineapple sage, which smells incredible. It actually does kind of smell like pineapple. I've seen a couple more chats pop up. Is there? Yep. Um, oh, uh, someone was wondering if um, tarragon is an annual or perennial. That was one of the questions. I had it and then it just slipped out of my head. Um, I'll have to look it up and get back to you. Yeah, I can <laughs> um, yeah maybe if, if you don't mind, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, and what's next? The other question was, would you recommend herbs that grow close to the ground be paired with taller vegetables like oregano with tomatoes, for example? Um, that one's a little bit trickier just your herbs, or most herbs like or need a, a lot of sun. And so you don't want, if your tomato plant gets too big and out, overcrowds it, then your herb is going to suffer. So you want to make sure just that you're, you're spacing appropriately. There's just some pretty pictures for different ways that you can organize an herb garden. Um, one of my favorite things are, I, I um, have British heritage, my mother's from England, and we spend a lot of time there. And in England, they have these not formal knot gardens, some of which are the herb garden. Um, the one, the picture on the bottom right, those are all different herbs. Uh, it's rosemary with various, I think it's various colored basils. Um, 
And so you can make your herb garden really beautiful if you have the time and the patience, which I do not, but I enjoy watching it. I enjoy seeing it. And you can, you can do this. You can do this with thymes. You can do this with sages and rosemaries and lavenders. Sometimes, I'm, like in the center one, those edging, the center and the left hand one, the edgings are boxwood. Um, but there's a lot of different things that you can do if you want to get that more formal look. Otherwise, you can, you can put your herbs in containers, you can put them in the ground in your, your existing beds. So when we're thinking about planting our herb garden, the site and the conditions are important. Drainage for herbs is very important. Most of our herbs do not like soil that stays wet. So if you do have a clay soil, you want to make sure that you are amending your soil. You want to apply one, one to two, in, or you want to amend, if possible, the entire area with compost so that you have, have increased your organic material, which helps improve our drainage. Um, and then you also want to add some mulch on the top la layer so that you can conserve your soil moisture. That way you're going to make sure that you don't have um, you don't have much, as much moisture loss. We live in an arid environment. We do tend to lose moisture pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. And having that mulch on top is going to help quite a bit. And like I said, most herbs do need a pretty much full sun, at least six hours. Um, preferably, if you have the ability to make, a, make the distinction, pref preferably give the herbs morning sun um, and have them be shaded in the afternoon. I know that's not an option for a lot of people, but that's just, that's how you're going to keep the very best aromatics, the very best qualities in your herbs. So if you do have alkaline soils, which most of us do, lavender, thyme, and rosemary are all very tolerant of alkaline soils. Uh, typically, our most herbs are not going to require much in the way of fertilizer. Uh, generally, so high nit fertilizer, and most of the time we, we think of fertilizer with nitrogen, a lot of nitrogen is going to encourage rapid growth. And so you might get a lot of foliage, but you might not have that nice, con that nice um, flavor in the, the herb itself. Um, and if you add too much fertilizer, you create a very succulent leaf, which is much more tempting for pests or diseases to come in. So you can give some light fertilization through the season, but it's not like some of our annual vegetable crops, which require very frequent fertilization in order for to have much success. Diseases of herbs, most herbs do are a little bit less susceptible to pests and disease. Um, this is probably because of the fact that they have those aromatics and those aromatics, I mean, we enjoy them, but the reason they, they start, they develop those aromatics was really to kind of fend off predators or fend off pests. It's, it's a defense mechanism. And so it's most of, most of our herbs are going to be less susceptible. They, they won't have as much of a problem with pests or disease problems. And that, uh, that's similar to that question that, oops, that we had for whether or not they're resistant to deer. They're not going to be nearly as toothsome to the deer as a lot of our other things. Oop, now I'm going backwards, sorry. Um, Diseases of herbs, um, they are still susceptible to some things. If you do start your seedlings in a soil that is not sterile, you're likely to get the fungal problem called dampening off. Dampening off is a fungal problem. It actually makes it look like the stem of the plant is pinched right at the soil level and kind of falls over. Um, and generally speaking, you can grow your seedlings like you would vegetables or flowers, making sure that you use a sterile seed starting mix. When you're looking at your garden, I mean, the ideal 
all of us have, right, is to maintain a weed-free garden. Not always realistic, but it's, it's a goal that we have in mind. <clears throat> you use uh, mulch, one to two inches or more of organic matter, wood chips, grass clippings, but only if you're not treating your grass with any kind of pesticides. Um, clean up your debris if you, ha if you have perennial herbs. Make sure that you get those cleaned up in the winter or very early spring before they start growing again. If you're growing annuals, practice crop rotation. Don't plant them in the same place every year. Um, perennials, obviously, that's not going to be possible um, because they live from year to year. And have that well-drained soil. And doing all these things is going to help reduce any pest or disease problems that you might have quite substantially. If you do have some pest problems, insect problems, um, then there are some things you can do. The most common problems you're going to see are probably insects like aphids or white flies. You might have some mites or some slugs. If you are able to, uh, you can hand pick them. Uh, for aphids, you can spray with a hard blast of water and that will knock them off. Mites, uh, spider mites, are usually a sign that the humidity is pretty low, so a spray of water increasing the ambient humidity will help. Uh, make sure if you are going to be eating these herbs that you do take care, read the label of any uh, chemical pesticide that you're using. And the term pesticide, that even includes an insecticidal soap or something that seems relatively mild like that. You just want to read the label. Most labels will tell you whether it is labeled for edible foods or not. And so you can make sure that you're, you're safe in that way. Um, and so in terms of slugs, slugs are usually common in a wet garden. So if you can either reduce the humidity or reduce the, the moisture that's sticking around where they're crawling around, you can also do a beer trap. Slugs are very, very tempted by beer. So if you nestle a cup into the ground, um, they will fall into the beer. They will drink themselves to death. That's a nice way to kind of manage them. Oh, and here's some pictures. There's those white flies. White flies are a greenhouse pest. They don't overwinter here, but they escape from greenhouse plants that we purchase every year. And so it's an annual problem. Generally not too big of a problem on a lot of our herbs. Ooh, got fancy animation there. There's that lovely slug. Okay, I think I saw a chat. Uh, question pop up again. Um, so someone just asked if sage was invasive. So if you want to, I just did a quick response, but if you want to speak more to that, um, I'm sure they'd love to hear it. Sage can be nominally invasive, but it's not, it's not invasive on the scale of like a chive or a mint. Um, it's one that you can, you can shovel prune it back pretty easily if it does start growing beyond where you want it to be. Okay, growing from seed. Most herbs can be grown from seed. Uh, you can buy, purchase the seeds at garden centers or from catalogs or the internet pretty easily. I've been looking around actually on the internet. People are buying seeds like crazy at the moment. A lot of places are sold out of a lot of things. It's kind of interesting. Um, a lot of herbs you do want to start pretty early. If you're thinking of starting your herbs from seed, we're definitely on the very late end of being able to do so. Often they, they take a little bit longer to get started than a lot of our annual crops. Um, but if you are planting, you want to kind of you want to use that sterile media to plant in, like I said. Um, and if your seed is really fine, then it's going to be planted very shallowly. Sometimes you're just putting it on the soil soil surface and just kind of skiffing over it with your hand. Um, because those very small seeds don't need a lot of soil contact in order to germinate and grow effectively. If you're growing something like a coriander, a dill, or a fennel, you can sow those directly into your garden. And then once you have your seedlings, you can transplant them once the soil warms. Um, of course, practicing, if you're familiar with it, hardening off where you kind of 
eke them out for, for longer and longer periods each day, getting them used to the outside climate instead of the lovely uniform temperatures and climate that they have inside. If you're, if you're growing sl slow to germinate um, plants, you can propagate cuttings or divisions. You can do this really easily with chives or mint or tarragon, and you can do it in the early spring or the fall. Uh, if you've got a friend or a neighbor who has chives or mint and you want some, they will happily give you some. Those things spread like crazy. And so you can take, for those you can actually divide out the roots and clump them. But if you're taking a cutting, then you take a three inch stem from a non-woody shoot. So you want it to still be kind of green and flexible. You cut just below a leaf node. You can use a rooting hormone, which you can order online. Um, sometimes some people have some people use cinnamon as a rooting hormone um, but you can also purchase an actual rooting hormone that will encourage those root growth and some of our herbs will success like scented geranium you don't even need a hormone you can just take the cutting and stick it in some water and those roots will start to grow out so there's a picture of kind of what you're doing for your cutting. So that's that three inch section. And you're looking at that leaf node and leaving a few leaves up at the top. So using, if you're using your herbs, most herbs develop their best aroma or flavor just before or at bloom time. If you remove those flower heads, it maintains their quality. The, the reasoning on that, if the, herb, if the part of the herb you're using is that leaf, plants put a ton of energy into a flower and then into producing a, a, a seed. And so if you want them to keep growing like a basil or a mint, then you want to encourage leaf growth and discourage flower growth. That flower growth will change the, the flavor. Basil, especially once it starts to flower, it gets really thick. Uh, the leaves do, or they get really tough, and they don't have that nice, fresh basil flavor. And of course, an exception on this, you're not going to be deadheading herbs that you're growing for seeds, um, because obviously then you won't be getting any seeds. Some herbs do sell seed, uh, like your dill and your fennel. If you don't have deadhead them, then you might have all the dill and all the fennel in the world <laughs> that you could ever want. Um, so it's something to be kind of just aware of. Deadheading, nice little picture here. This person's using an an anvil pruner. You can use that, honestly, for deadheading. Usually I just use a pair of scissors. Um, or if it's a woody plant, it's not best practice, but you can just pop the flower heads off as well. Did I see a question pop up? I don't think so. Okay. Um, okay, so for using herbs for har harvesting, time of harvest is very important, and this is in terms of time of day as well as time in the life cycle. One of the nice things about growing to eat is that you get to eat your plants, and so while the plant is growing, take a little leaf off, as long as it's not teeny, teeny, tiny, and you're taking like a quarter of the leaves off. You can take a little leaf off and taste it or smell it, rub it in your fingers and see where that aroma is. Test it at different types of the day or times of the day. Um, most of our herbs are going to have a much better flavor, much better aroma in the morning than they will in the afternoon. Um, but for example, when you, whenever you are harvesting, the flavor can change. So coriander, if you pick it green, it's going to be a spicy, waxy smell. Uh, if you're letting it get to fully ripe, um, then it's going to be a sharp and spicy sweet smell. So it really can kind of change as the plant matures, the plant grows. And for some things you want to harvest them young, for some herbs you want to harvest them older. And that's one of the great things you get to just kind of experiment where it feels right for you. And some people might like it at a different stage than others. So if you are harvesting to preserve, Make sure that you have watered your plants well one, for the, a couple of days before you are planning to harvest. Make sure that you harvest in the morning, but after any dew has dried, and finish harvesting by the time the heat of the day has really come up. Transpiration in the plants increases more, or transpiration 
is higher in the afternoon when, it, when temperatures are hotter and so the aromatic qualities are reduced in the plant. And then you can rinse and dry your herbs, usually dry them out of the sun. It's going to help, help maintain as much of the flavor as possible. If you are harvesting a herb for its leaves, wait until just before those flowers are going to bloom. Uh, any fragrances that attract pollinators are going to be at their peak. If you're harvesting something for flowers, make sure that you harvest before the bloom fully opens. So if you're looking at like lavender stock, you wanna harvest right before those blooms open. If you see one opening at the top, that's okay. Um, lavender actually opens sequentially down the stalk. Um, so usually if you see one start to open, then it's a good time to start to, to harvest. If you're gathering seeds, then you can gather the seeds right as the color starts to change. If they're still green, wait a little while, wait until they go brown or gray before you pull them off that plant because you're going to get the best flavor in once the, that seed is mature. This we've kind of looked at a little bit. If you're, um, if you're looking to preserve your herbs, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, with the wonders of modern technology, the freezer is a great option. If you store your herbs in an airtight container, which can be as simple as a Ziploc bag, it keeps the flavor for a good long time. Um, it retains more flavor than drying or um, pressing is going to. Drying is gonna be one of your most popular methods, but it does lose some of the quality, some of the aroma. If you've ever worked with fresh basil versus a dried basil, you can definitely see the difference in aroma between the two. So there's an example of freezing herbs. You can put those in a Ziploc bag, kind of squeeze as much air out as possible. I've seen a really good example where you actually immerse the sealed part of the bag into water and then seal it up because all of the air will have been pushed out by the pressure of the water. If you're drying your herbs, you can do a couple different methods. You can actually dry herbs in the microwave sandwich them between two different layers of paper towels and pop them in the oven or you can oh I my next picture you can also bundle them up that must be a little bit later in the tuck you can bundle them up and hang them to dry as well air drying is going to be your simplest method you can like i said put them on a layer of paper towels or on cheesecloth if you're using reusables make sure that it keeps up that you keep them out of direct sun make sure that they're not layered over each other because you want to reduce as much moisture contact as possible a lot of our herbs have a lot of moisture in their leaves and so they're going to retain a lot of moisture and potentially have mold problems if you're not keeping them well dried out if you need to, you can stir them or turn them, flip them over one to two times a day until they have dried out. And of course, like I said, you can, for large amounts, you can tie the stems together. You can hang them in a dark, well-ventilated area. And then once they have dried out, you can strip them from the stems and store them in a container. There's that picture. I'm sure we all have a room like that in our homes, right? But that you can usually find a space in, in your house where you can dry some herbs if there are things that you like to dry. I usually don't do too much herb drying. I use it fresh or I buy it from the store. <laughs> but if you're growing enough to save for the winter, then that's a nice option. Um, that is a really good link if you just jot down the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, it's going to give you a lot of really good resources on preserving. Um, it's a good kind of first place to go when you have some questions. I can talk very well about the growing and the harvesting, but I'm not so good on the food food safety side of things. So I'll put that in just for a little bit of, here's some food safety. Any other questions? 
So um, there's a question about organic potting soil and if that would be a good media for seeds. They're not sure if it's sterile. Mm. So generally speaking, organic versus non organic soil isn't going to be the deciding factor. Um, you can give it a try, but the thing is, potting soils are, are treated Treated a little treated differently than a sapping off. You can give it a try and you might be lucky, but you might not. Um, it once you've got a transplant, once you've got a seedling that's up, you can definitely use your organic potting soil for it. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick drink of water. Okay, if you are doing, um, if you're if you don't have a garden or if you don't want to deal with growing outside, you, you can definitely grow, grow a lot of herbs as plants. Uh, some of our perennial herbs. Just yeah, and you can have herb uh, grow well indoors or archived and found winter savory and bay. Sunlight, then you can do a D lights are cheap and affordable now, which is great. And you can pop those onto your herb and keep things growing really well. Mint, bay, and rosemary are going to tolerate not too much light, um, but they do need they do need they do need light. Um, lemon balm and tarragon will tolerate a little bit less light than that. Even if you don't have proper light, uh, your your herbs are going to become thin and spindly. You're not going to get much leaf growth and you probably won't get the aroma that you really want. So if you are growing on a windowsill like in this picture just twist those pots around fairly frequently so they get the most light they can but if you can justify it getting an LED light onto them is going to give you a lot of benefit. I'm really realizing that I'm running out of time. Um, humidity and circulation I'm gonna zip through these just so that I can get to some of the varieties for you guys. Um, keeping humidity high when you're growing inside is a really good idea. You can use a pebble tray like this to kind of up the ambient humidity. Make sure that your containers have drainage. So you put a pot, a, a drainage pot container underneath. Um, wait to water until the mix starts to dry out at up to your first knuckle. You, not right at the surface, but if you stick your finger in up to that first layer. If you have fertilizer, um, or make sure that you're fertilizing to a limited amount, but not too much. You don't want to give a big jolt of growth, which will outgrow the aroma. So here are some herbs and I'm going to try and get through a few of them. Um, some good herbs to grow are annuals, basil, coriander, dill, marjoram, biennials, caraway and parsley, perennials, catnip, chives, fennel, lavender, oregano, rosemary, sage, thyme, and peppermint. So basil, and I know I say that weird, like I said, my mother's British, so I say a few things differently. <laughs> um, Basil is going to be an annual plant. It's going to have white flowers on spikes. Generally, you don't want to see those spike, those flowers. You want to pinch those off. Basil is one of those that it's an easy herb to grow, although I cannot grow it to save my life. For some reason, it's, it's my nemesis plant, and I never have luck with it. But 90% of people have great ease growing it. You do want to pinch the stems back to promote really bushy growth since you're looking for leaves. 
and when you use it, you can cook it fresh or dried. Our coriander, so the seed is the coriander and then the fresh leaf is the um, cilantro. It's an annual. And it has wonderful flowers in flat heads. Um, it's easily grown seeds. You want to wait until those seeds grow. If you're harvesting at Panic Farm, and we would harvest just like shear, shear we would just shear off the entire row of, of cilantro and then it would regrow. So you can definitely do that. Cool. So it's a tall, two, it's a taller herb, two to three feet high. Um, flowers are yellow. You can sow your seed after the frost is has passed. It's not it doesn't like to be transplanted, so it's a direct sow. You might, if you're watering or fertilizing really well, you might need to stake it. Um, for harvesting, you can pick the leaves as the flowers open. If you're harvesting for the seeds, you can, you can wait until those seeds are flat and black, brown. And there's a lot of different uses. You can flavor pickles and sauerkraut and beets, um, potato chips. <laughs> there's a lot of different things you can you can put dill into. I've seen a lot of people who put in the, the entire dill flour into their pickle bar when they make their own pickles. Parsley. Parsley is a biennial, but usually we grow it as an annual. It's got divided or sometimes curly leaves. We don't really see the flowers. Cut when the leaves are of the size that you need to use. You can use it as a garnish. Um, you can use it as a flavoring. I have some, seen some people who use it actually as a pesto as well. Catnip. Uh, catnip is either the joy or bane of most gardeners' existence because sometimes you, you inherit a patch and you didn't really want it and you don't have a cat. But if you do have a cat, then they will love you if they are susceptible to it. Uh, it's a hardy perennial. Uh, it's three to four feet tall. Those heart-shaped leaves are green and green on the top, gray beneath. They grow in sun or shade, so the, this one will grow anywhere. <laughs> um, if you want to split it, you can divide it by the roots. Um, if you're looking to use it for your cats, you can cut and dry leafy tops, uh, the, the, the flower tops. You can also dry the leaves. Um, you can use it as a tea for yourself, although I personally think the flavor is not that great for us. And of course, kitty drugs. I mean, a, a doped out cat is the most hilarious thing ever. So um, there is a difference between cat nip and cat mint. Cat mint is an ornamental mint. Um, some cats are a little bit, there is a little bit of that substance in cat mint, but it is a different plant. It has a different growth habit. Cat nip is, the, is like you saw in the previous photo. Chives. Chives are a perennial. Um, they are an onion-like plant. They usually grow in clumps. They have those lovely purple flowers, although there are some with white flowers as well. They do not need much care in the, in, at all. Um, I have them in an old repurposed back, bathtub in my backyard, and I water it when I remember, and they grow great. And the flowers are great for my bees, and then I can go out and pull some whenever I want to. You do want to use the fresh leaves. Um, you don't want to harvest the flower stalk itself. The flower stalk gets pretty woody, but the flower, it's, the flower can be a very nice addition to a butter or to a salad or something like that. And it's a very mild onion flavor. There's, some, there's garlic chives and then there's onion chives. There's a couple different types. Uh, fennel is another perennial, but we usually grow it as an annual here. It's not hardy. Um, it does grow from seed planted in spring. Uh, you usually have to plant it pretty early though. To harvest, you can pick the seeds when they're ripe. The stems are taste tastiest when you pick them right before they're about to bloom. Lavender, the one that everybody loves. Um, there's a couple different types of lavender, which I'll get into, but generally lavender has purple flowers on a single spike. Um, they like rocky, dry, and sunny places. Huh, almost like they're made to grow here. Um, you can propagate them by seed or by taking cuttings. Usually you do need to do some kind of protection for them in winter. Um, 
When you harvest them, you can cut whole spikes um, as flowers. Usually you can dry them on the spikes and then brush them off later or use them still on that spike. Usually lavender is typically most often just used for the fragrance and their oil. Um, some people, I have seen people do like a, a lavender flavored ice cream and stuff. So there are some, some flavoring things that you can do. There are several different types of lavender. There's the English lavender, which is hardy in our zones. And there's the lavendin, which is a cross between English and the French, uh, French and Spanish lavenders. Um, and then there's the French and Spanish lavenders, which I won't get into just because they're not cold hardy. So we don't, we're not able to grow them here. If you're interested in trying a variety of lavender, then you can, these are some varieties you can look for. The Hidcoat, the Munstead, the Provence, and the right White Grosso are all some varieties that you can give, you can seek out and try if you're interested in growing lavender. Rosemary. This is a perennial, but it does need to come indoors during the winter, and this would be one that would need supplemental light to do well in the winter. The narrow leaves are going to be leather-like. It does like well-drained, sunny locations. You can propagate with cuttings or with seed. Uh, the more you pinch those tips back, the more you're going to get brushy or dense growth. Um, you're going to harvest those fresh leaves, and it's delightful as a garnish on a lot of our a lot of our meats and um, just overall rosemary is delightful and it's it's one that for me at least if you're in the depths of winter and dis winter despair it's a, a scent of summer i think sage so in there you can see that um multicolored sage that i talked about that you could do an entire sage garden with all different varieties Sage is a perennial. It's generally a little bit more on the woody side. They can get pretty tall, two to three feet tall. They do tend to be sprawly, so they're not, they're not a really polite plant. You can start them indoors as seed, or you can take cuttings. They do need full sun. The plants need to be two to two and a half feet apart, and you can cut back to the ground every three to four years to let them kind of start over and regrow. The leaves are going to be best if you pick them before or as they're blooming. Um, cut back the stems after they bloom. They are aromatic and slightly bitter. You can use them in cooking with your fish, your pork, uh, your poultry. They're really nice in the sage. All right, peppermint. Peppermint is a perennial with very easily spreading roots. Uh, they usually have a purplish or a whitish flower. Uh, they do like a rich, moist soil, but honestly, they'll grow in our soil just fine. Um, the more frequently you cut, the better you're going to get growth off of them. And you can use the leaves. The, it's best to harvest just as your flowers appear. Thyme is a woody plant with small leaves, very small leaves sometimes. Generally, it's a low-growing plant. A lot of times, thyme is used as a ground cover. It can have white or pink, very small flowers. It does like fairly light, well-drained soil. It does tolerate our alkaline soils well. Um, and it does do well in raised beds. It likes that little bit of extra heat that your raised beds can give them. If you're gonna harvest your thyme, any time that the plant is actively growing, you just snip off the desired amount. You do want to pull it off, pull off the leaves off of the woody part. Um, the woody part's not very tasty. Uh, you can use it for teas and meaty flavorings in, or flavorings in your meat dishes. A little bit of some less common herbs, your walking onion. Uh, can be a little bit invasive, but you can actually, in the picture there, you can actually eat those little onion bulblets, and when it comes